welcome to the last lecture on this course uh, MM713 aqueous corrosion and its control. Uh, today I thought uh, I will just talk about in general how do you really uh, you know manage corrosion? What are the broad guidelines that one would follow in controlling corrosion? Before we do that, it is uh, better to review what we have seen so far. We said that we broadly categorize this course into two parts. The first part was on thermodynamics and uh, kinetics of corrosion. The second part deals with the various uh, forms of corrosion. And in the thermodynamics and kinetics primarily we focused on two questions. The first question was can we predict if a metal can undergo corrosion or not and we used the electrochemical concepts to predict the corrosion because that is much easier than using the free energy concept. Then for quantification we looked at the, the kinetics of the corrosion and wherein we started with the simple Tafel uh, relationships, the relation between the over voltage and the and the current as an electrochemical reaction would have. The news that the Tafel relationship to uh, to calculate the E core value and I core value that is corrosion potential and corrosion current densities. And then we went on applying this to a complex systems of uh, corrosion processes wherein we can use uh, the, the concepts to, to predict corrosion in a complex situations where you have multiple cathodic reactions, where there are flow velocities, where there are some additives, where there are galvanic corrosions. In fact, we started applying this to all forms of corrosion we have been talking about when you talk about the different forms of corrosion. Having understood the uh, how we can able to look at the prediction and uh, the quantification of corrosion, we looked at the various forms of corrosion as applicable to uh, industries. We looked at the various forms of corrosion from the point of view of industrial applications only. And we 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 this classify them as various forms of corrosion primarily because the way you control corrosion would be different depending upon the mechanism of corrosion we talk about and so we we look at in details for various forms of corrosion the mechanism of corrosion we looked at we looked at the parameters affecting the corrosion we looked at the corrosion control measures test methods. In all these cases we also saw the illustrations and to highlight how they are important and what are the signatures that these failures leave behind. So, all this we looked at over the last uh, 33 lectures we saw that. The one uh, thing that we need to look at is the corrosion control is a major domain beyond understanding prediction, quantification of that and understanding the various forms of corrosion because it is occurring in industries, because it is an industrial problem. So, you must have a clarity in how do you approach the corrosion problem. The corrosion problem I would like to see as a perspective, as a control as a perspective. Anyone who, who talks about corrosion control, so start with the drawing board right. In the project stage, in the project stage it has to be integrated in the project stage. 
the no point in start worrying about corrosion control when you have you know commissioned the reactor and process is on because that is going to be very expensive process. So, start with the design of system as you do you know as a mechanic engineer does for taking care of various other aspects of a reactor or a structure and so on. We should integrate this in the design itself. How do you integrate uh, when you decide you integrate in the design the whole thing then comes of course, the fabrication right in the actual fabrication of the component. And I think now you must be aware of having understood various forms of corrosion how the fabrication also can influence the corrosion right a welding problem could be one of the things a dissimilar metals that you can come into contact with your problems you know. So, the fabrication also we should look at how the corrosion can influence be influenced by this uh, fabrication. The plant commissioning is another one which is equally important in order to in order to reduce the corrosion process. There are cases where the people started the project by the time you ended the several component got corroded actually ok. So, it is important to look at the plant commissioning stages also right and then comes the operation of the particular unit a particular equipment ok or particular industry for example. You know in here we should now take care of those aspects of that. Now, I am going to now look at in each every case broadly you know again it is very hard to go in much details uh, let us go little bit more uh, broadly uh, how you look at these four aspects of design fabrication and you also talk about plant commissioning and operation of that. When you talk about a design the first thing that comes is what is the function of that right. What is the function what function does it really do so, that is the major thing is it is it the heat exchanger is it a pipeline is it a conveyor belt it could be a simply a crusher can happen in a cement factory what is the function of that. Why it is important is please notice the material selection that you talk about does not primarily consider corrosion as the requirement in many cases. So, the material selection depends upon the functional requirement of particular industry component at all actually ok. So, that is why you need to look at what is the function of the plant you need going to be there if not the function then you can also start looking at the environment what is that environment you should review the environment there what kind of uh, feed feedstock being used ok what are the input from there ok what are the pH of that and what is the chloride content and what is the water content in that what are the organics present here what are the temperatures what are the pressure all this we need to review and when you start reviewing this and you know what the function of the plant is then you can look at the control measures the control measures must sync with the main function of the plant otherwise you know nobody is going to listen to you right ok. Just because it is corrosion resistance you cannot use the particular material at all. Now, corrosion control measures you have seen before I just want to uh, just uh, you know highlight to you what kind of corrosion control measures it could be a material selection you can talk about it could be a coating to be use of inhibitors you can go for cathodic protection systems in some cases even anodic protection systems you can use. And of course, when you talk about corrosion control monitoring is equally important. So, you can use the corrosion control I mean corrosion monitoring probes or online monitoring probes are used actually ok. So, probes also can be because you know when you want to put the probe you should have a provision in the reactor right. If you know provision in the reactor tomorrow you cannot just put a probe there it does not happen. So, start in the design stage if you have this idea about it then they are incorporated into the design of the particular system actually. So, the design stage you take care of them 
then you of course, you talk about the fabrication and the things. Here inspection are very important and people follow the codes. Codes are very important, I think we are not dealing with this right now, but as you go along and serve in the industry, we know there are so many codes, API codes, for example, all petroleum things, ASME boiler codes, we are going to be there. So, these codes would be enforced in all the stages, even design stage, fabrication stage, commissioning stage, these codes will be a part of corrosion control exercise that you have. Coming to operation, it is very important to adapt the corrosion control measures. You know, in the design stage itself, you decide know what to do, or am I going to go for cathode protection, or am I going to go for inhibitors, or am I going to add, I mean, uh, uh, you know, am I going to, uh, you know, uh, go for a cathode protection, for example, coatings. So, this whatever that you decide, they are to be properly adapted in the in, in the in the practice, the maintenance of the environment and process control. See, uh, I have seen industries where people have designed for certain you know operations in terms of temperatures, pressure, feed feedstock they use and tomorrow they change it because the feedstock they get are different. So, a refinery for example, they may get a crude maybe from somewhere middle east, there is certain amount of hydrogen sulfide present, certain amount of carbon dioxide present, they change the crude because uh, because the cost becomes low, but no more the constituents, the corrosion constituents are same. So, it changes. So, that means you need to take care of that you know if you take. So, the so, if you are going to do that then you should see how we are going to manage it, otherwise the reactor is going to prematurely fail. I have seen cases where people want to increase the production by rising temperature and pressure just fails in a week, it worked for 20 years just failed in one week time actually. So, the maintenance of the environment and process control systems are very important, look at the how much it can have excursion ok, that is something very very essential ok. Of course, inspection is a part of this actually ok, inspection and maintenance ok, they are all part of the systems, you need to look at the you know uh, look at the inspection, inspection team should be aware of of uh, of the corrosion issues how to do that. Inspection itself is a big subject, where do you inspect ok, is a big issue. For example, I have a long pipeline of 1000 kilometer long, am I going to inspect every inch of the pipeline. So, people sometimes would use models to look at risk based inspection, we will see later ok, ok. Where you have more risk, you focus on that location that is based on the models, based on the mechanisms and way you know how you predict where you, you think the corrosion becomes very severe. It happens in nuclear power plants, it happens in thermal power plants, it happens in many uh, systems where uh, the the, uh, the 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 issues are very critical that do that. So, it is a broad philosophy of um, of corrosion control and we should really enforce that. Now, what uh, we are not seen ok. So, when you when you what also you do is uh, it is very interesting to see here, when you do when you adopt corrosion control measures, you do inspection, you do maintenance, you learn new things. See the problem with the corrosion is it is a time dependent process, it is very difficult to have a test which can simulate exactly the, the operating conditions and get a data in short time. So, many times you do an accelerated test either you over predict or you have underestimate the corrosion. So, when you do operations you know how the systems are working. So, what happens you plow back ok, you 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 you, you plow back what learned what you learned from this from the operations and put it back into the designs. The next generation of design takes into account the experience and you also in fact use it to refine your models ok, so that the predictive models becomes more useful at all. So, this what I think is done, we will go to spend some time on material selection very some some time. Um, so, material selection we have seen it uh, under various forms of corrosion, 
So, when is a galvanic corrosion, pitting corrosion, crevice corrosion, all this you know erosion corrosion, and even centralization we have seen uh, how we do a material selection for a given corrosion problem. I am going to give a broad perspective here and uh, you know so that we, we save some time you know if you take a photo in a book uh, it is a, it's a big chapter on material selection actually ok. It deserves to be given, but it is introductory course and we do not have much time. So, uh, I am going to be a bit more um, uh, brief in this. Now somebody asks you as a corrosion engineer what is the material what is the basis of material selection? You simply jump into into saying that oh corrosion is is the issue. So, I want to choose the material which gives you a best corrosion resistance that is not the case ok. That is not the case. There are so many factors that decide what material to be selected. I have given some of them here, but not it is not an exhaustive list by no means. It makes you to feel that how you look at material selection that is the reason why we are given this, but no way it is a comprehensive ok. So, first and foremost in the material selection process as you have seen before you 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 look at the operating conditions, you review the environment and you foresee possible failure mechanisms. Will it suffer a stress corrosion cracking? Will it undergo selective leaching? Will it undergo sensitization? Because you have now expert that should be much easier for you to do that ok. So, if you know the operating conditions and it is possible for you to predict what kind of corrosion mechanism, corrosion failure it can it can operate in given situations. So, the material selections that is the main hinge ok and that is if it having a problem you have to search alternative material or you have to find some other way of overcoming the problem ok. But you need to recognize what is the kind of corrosion problem in a given operating conditions can happen in a plant. The second issue is the product requirement right. Sometimes the engineering allows certain amount of corrosion we have seen it also earlier you know when you select materials what is the corrosion allowance we talked about right. You can in you can put a corrosion allowance, but then the product says no you cannot allow any corrosion to take place ok. Because it may be a, a drinking water, it, it came for a pharmaceutical industries or some kind of chemicals you, you make you do not want to be contaminated. So, there is another requirement which is a product requirement. The product requirement demands a high uh, purity I think corrosion resistance becomes utmost important. You select the material properly ok. So, that you can bring down the corrosion uh, rate, but sometimes what happens? you bring down the corrosion rate by just applying a stainless steel, the stainless steel cracks because that environment the temperature content is such that it cracks. So, you may bring down the overall corrosion uh, you know uh, rate by choosing stainless steel, but you are going to have it, a newer problem. In which case what do you do? You probably go for a carbon steel, you give a lining, you can give a glass lining can work actually ok. So, that is how it works. So, the material selection process is a evolution process. It has many dimension to that actually ok. The one more issue somebody in an oil and gas industry they have offshore platform there is a drilling they are, they are doing a drilling there ok and then taking oil and I want to choose the material. What is the problem there? The problem is the replacement becomes a problem right. Even I say that I want to replace the replacement cost is much more than the cost of the component actually. So, which means you better go for better materials that is another rider comes over there ok. So, where you cannot monitor, where you cannot inspect, where you cannot replace it quickly you have no choice but to go for a better material with respect to corrosion actually ok. That is another factor that comes into picture. Design and fabrication 
oh you choose a good material, but you cannot weld it. Very nice cast iron ok you have iron you know and 14 percent silicon best corrosion resistance you know you can have it you cannot weld it actually right. So, there are other factors that comes into picture is can you really fabricate what is the other other requirement that you have ok that comes into picture here in the setting this maintenance. In some cases I can afford to inspect maintenance you know once in 6 months some cases I cannot afford to do it for 3 years, 4 years ok. So, then what happens? Then obviously, the choice of material the cost is not going to be consideration there at all actually ok. If you are going to give additional production measures then you can reduce the cost. A ship hull is an example a carbon seal use right it is not a great material, but is used in seawater applications. How you apply a coating you carry out a cathodic protection it does work. So, you can also look at additional production methods used and so you can go for a cost effective material can happen at all ok. Because all this we are doing because there is one factor many times you know you need to consider can be overriding also is the cost of the material actually. The cost is more then of course, you are nobody is going to listen to you. The cost again should be seen not in the cost of material the cost should be seen in a broader sense like life cycle cost. If I use a carbon steel will it work for 2 years, if I use a stainless steel it can work for 20 years and we cannot compare the cost in that manner. How do you compare it? You compare it as a life cycle cost ok. And of course, uh, you know suppose you do a good painting, the painting the very painting process is should be very expensive you know or it can be equally costing as a paint itself ok. So, then you go for better paints because it is not going to be easy. All are fine, I want to use materials there is a big embargo right, you are not getting the material in India now right, what do you do about it right. So, materials availability is equally important one or I come out with a fantastic design from mechanical engineering point of view or this gives you better efficiency gives everything, but what happens there is no material available to withstand that operating conditions. One is availability the ability of the materials to function the way that you want it actually right. So, there is another dimension to the to the problem ok selection materials from purely from mechanical engineering point of view chemical engineering point of view does not work because that material may not. In fact, there are several applications the critical thing is what material right you cannot withstand very high temperatures I want to have it 1500 degrees Celsius it does not happen ok. So, material availability one more thing ok all of them I have fantastic low cost I produced only yesterday I have only small data that I have I want to fly tomorrow I want to use it in the aircraft I think they are think very much the data availability how robust this data can count a lot in terms of in terms of meter selections so, that is somewhere very cautious. So, that is why people what the people do is the, the time that is develop a particular material and come to the production and usages or may take be 10 years 5 years it takes because the data becomes a problem. If the data is not available you have to be extremely careful ok in terms of um, uh, you know selecting the material or if you select it I have to have some way of monitoring that more properly ok. So, these are some basis for material selection please again they are not by any means all exhaustive uh, you can add more to it uh, because as you start practicing you know there are so many critical issues which decide which add to the material selection issues. So, that is what I think you should uh, you should consider in in this actually. Now, when you are talking about material selection we we always uh, you know you know see people look at differently at different people material selection in my experience like that. If you are going to talk about you know any deck changer a mechanical engineer talks about from the point of heat transfer ok. He looks at heat transfer. From a corrosion point of view it is a different issue together. I can tell you suppose I use a copper based alloy the copper based alloys have high thermal conductivity as compared to carbon steels as compared to stainless steel. 
but you know what happens to be the car with the copper alloys? Copper alloys with the time it may not corrode more, but it starts falling, it just falls. When it falls, it forms a scale, and those scales are what? They are uh, you know you can hinder the heat transfer, and so what happens? Then it becomes a problem. So, the material selection when you talk about we have look at the various properties uh, not necessarily corrosion actually you know. In fact, I seen this happening more with the, the with the with the people the, the, the people would have background of metallurgy actually and would be involved in design they do happen and get into problems. So, we have seen it also in 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 in, um, in you know in the last uh, about 33 uh, you know lectures we have seen ok and in bits and pieces we have seen you know how uh, the, uh, the the material properties affect, but I give you uh, a bit more uh, comprehensive manner. Heat treatment, can you give an example where the heat treatment can be a problem in for corrosion? Yeah, yeah sensitization uh, it could be a problem, we are going to use aluminum alloys, high strength aluminum alloys heat treatment could be a problem, peak age you would use it is going to get embrittled in the environment right. So, heat treatment could be a problem and we are going to use a modern static stainless steel, a steel if you do not temper it you are going to undergo stress corrosion cracking high dynamic embrittlement can happen ok. So, heat treatment is, is is something one really looks at it, hardness macro and micro again macro in overall sense micro means suppose you weld what happens to the to the weldment does the hardness increase it can affect the stress corrosion cracking at an embrittlement. Of course, tensile properties toughness ductile brittle transient temperatures stability against temperatures uh, you know again corrosion is what we are looking at actually. So, these are the properties that you watch out for in overall uh, you know um, uh, you know the overall aspect in 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 designing a particular reactor particular vessel. And, and so on. We will come to materials ok. We generally I put here metals I am not covering the non metals. Please understand that there is no way you can exclude other materials ok for the construction purposes ok. There are plastics and there are um, ceramics being used, there are non metals are being used actually ok. And, um, but what I listed given list is is kind of broad uh, you know um, uh, you know uh, broadly they are used I would say. And uh, I have given uh, you can see here the cast ions, steels, low alloy steels, stainless steels, nickel base alloys, copper base alloys, aluminum alloys, titanium alloys, zirconium alloys, tantalum. Tantalum is not used as an alloy, normally used as a element only ok. Now, these are the materials uh, generally used and again the criteria for choosing any of this you have seen before, what is the kind of criteria that you would talk about ok. They should all apply over here ok. So, that you can optimize uh, the material uh, selection for a given application um, in this list now ok. Let me just give you the broad thing about how the materials are being used in the things now. I just touch upon first the ferrous group of metals based on iron ok. How do we really use actually? So, let me start with the with the uh, the ferrous group of uh, of the uh, metals which uh, I think ferrous groups are very widely used along all the alloys we listed now ok. And in the ferrous group the basic material is is a cast iron ok. And you know what a cast iron is it has a large amount of uh, carbon in that and uh, and so the cost is is less and it can be used as a structural material. But what is the limitation of this? What is the limitation using cast iron? Why, why can't you use everywhere cast iron? Yeah? 
it is brittle can be there are of course, some cast irons and ductile also. So, you cannot fabricate it very easily you know the fabrication becomes a problem. Even workability is a problem you cannot draw into a sheet, you cannot draw them into wire that is a problem that you see in the case of the cast irons. So, what you do is if you remove the carbon in the cast iron you get into the carbon steel. The carbon steel is a basic structural material even if you look at many of the important industries refineries, uh, chemical process industries, power plants the major constituents of materials is still the carbon steel. We may talk about stainless steel all this yeah they are important, but the major structural material still is the carbon steel. So, it is the advantage you can fabricate you can weld lot of advantages of that ok. What is the problem with that? The problem is it is a poor corrosion resistance it is a basic material. The corrosion resistance of that is is not that great. So, how do you improve corrosion resistance? You add chromium, but you cannot add chromium when you have large amount of carbon. So, remove carbon you add chromium you get into a stainless steel that is called as ferritic grade stainless steels. It has got a reasonable corrosion resistance as it exhibits passivity ok, but what is the problem? The problem that lies here is that it is difficult to weld you know you can weld, but the weldability is little bad it has got you know uh, poor resistance against hydrogen embrittlement. So, you want to improve upon this what do you do? Add to it a nickel right add to this nickel when add nickel to it you get a different class of stainless steel which is nonstenetic grade stainless steel. There are two types here 300 series and a 200 series. The 200 series is uh, is having more amount of manganese and the 300 series consists of nickel as the alloying element. You know nickel is required to stabilize the arsenic phase. When you use this one it has got high strength you can weld very easily I mean no doubt about weldability is very good, but what is the problem here? The problem with the stainless steel is it is prone to pitting, it is prone to crevice corrosion, of course, it is prone to stress corrosion cracking as well ok. Now, in order to uh, minimize or lower the pitting tendency, crevice corrosion tendency, what do you do? You add to it molybdenum to this, you get 316 stainless steel, you get a super austenitic grade stainless steels you get a even super ferritic stainless steels. So, you get a another variation of stainless steel they are reasonably resistance against fatigue corrosion and crevice corrosion. In order to avoid pitting corrosion you have other alternative alternative is what copper based alloys ok. So, we will not be covering here copper based alloys, but you have an option of going to copper based alloys. But this copper based alloys and uh, high moly containing stainless steels are generally resistance against pitting and crevice corrosion actually. Now, when you take a austenitic grade stainless steel generally they are prone to sensitization we know about that right. So, how do you control this? You minus carbon uh, right you get a new variety of stainless steels which is 304 and 316L low carbon stainless steels you know how we can reduce that. And this uh, this this uh, you know the the one here the ferritic uh, ferritic here and austenitic here this is the two class of stainless steels are used between these two austenitic is very widely used ferritic of course, are used for limited applications they do that. So, um, so low carbon stainless steels are of course, resistance to uh, the sensitization and but then you have not addressed the issue of uh, stress corrosion cracking so far ok. 
So, how do you address this? You go into duplex grade stainless steels, right. Duplex grade stainless steel here means it consists of a ferrite phase and a arsenide phase. How do you get it? If you go from arsenide, you lower the nickel content, right, you increase the chromium content, you get into duplex grade stainless steels, ok. And um, so, uh, so this is how you, you develop this this kind of stainless steel, which is resistance against stress corrosion cracking may have been. But nevertheless, the alloy is still prone to uh, what is called as the crevice corrosion. You can also go for high nickel alloy, which is inconal actually. The inconal gives you high resistance against the SEC, but the inconal is expensive, ok. So, uh, you, you can strike a balance between arsenic degrade stainless steels and the inconal alloy in terms of cost. So, you go into duplex stainless steel and you can have SEC resistance offered by the duplex stainless steels actually. It costs more as I, as I told you and and um, it is resistance to SEC, but if you look at the duplex stainless steels they are still prone to crevice corrosion and pitting corrosion because you remove nickel content in this actually right. So, add nickel add more chromium you go into what is called as super duplex stainless steels 2507 we talked about the 25 chromium uh, 7 nickel that we have ok and uh, it has got resistance to SEC, it is resistance to uh, pitting corrosion, crevice corrosion, but it is not real resistance. You cannot use in sea water application. Still there are some issues with the duplex stainless steels. So, recently they have come out with the a better grade of uh, duplex stainless steel which is called as hyper duplex stainless steels. You add further nickel, you have further nitrogen, you have further chromium to it and again maintain the phase balance and this uh, uh, this uh, alloy is offering resistance against SCC and uh, pitting and crevice corrosion resistance. So, they are being used in sea water applications ok. Of course, when you when I do all this happily like a tree going from cast iron to super duplex in the steels to hyper duplex in the steels and to nickel I mean conal alloys you have to keep in mind the cost also goes up from the bottom most to the top most. So, the corrosion control also comes with the cost, but the bottom line is what? The bottom line is the life cycle cost, the safety involved here. See, there are certain things as I told you when I talk about material selection, I did not discuss about safety involved, environment involved. There are so many issues which we also talk about when we, when we um, deal with the, the, the material selection. So, this is about the, the ferrous group of materials. Um, used uh, you know in industries and a uh, lot of developments have taken place over the time period. The next class of material which is uh, called aluminum light light metals actually. Light metals from the corrosion point of view they are not many used. As I told you that material selection depends upon what? Depends upon the functional requirement. Light means it is required for certain applications like transportation application. I want to be light ok, but otherwise some application you do not care it should be light at all. So, aluminum is used in the transportation industries and it is also used where you you you, you do not want to spend too much money and you want to be corrosion resistance you know that is also possible to do that. So, let us look at this aluminum alloy, aluminum it is a light metal ok and uh, you have good corrosion resistance you know it forms a stable oxide film in the atmosphere. So, it is resistance to corrosion ok that is a really good thing, but it has a low strength. You know very very pure aluminum you know what is the strength of it? It can be 50 to 60 mega Pascals. So, low right. So, you want to increase the strength further what do you do? We add this alloying elements such as copper, zinc and copper, magnesium you know the various alloying elements are added and there are several different alloy systems have been developed 2000 series and 7000 series aluminum alloys or high strength aluminum alloys. When you add these elements when you increase the strength ok strength goes up ok. We, we, we talked I think other day made reference to peak age and over aged kind of things. When you add the strength you know when you add these elements the strength goes up 
the problem is that the problem is it is prone to pitting, prone to exfoliation, prone to stress corrosion cracking, is prone to hydrogen embrittlement actually. Especially exfoliation, stress corrosion cracking, and hydrogen embrittlement are related to the microstructures, ok, and and microstructure depend upon the alloying elements and the heat treatment. So, if you have high strength, well, the service life is not going to be great because you are prone to these kind of corrosion problems. To overcome this, you give a heat treatment and that heat treatment is called as overaging treatment and overaging treatment ok, there is a loss in strength that is one of the problems, but it is resistance against SCC, resistance against exfoliation and air embrittlement and all is good, but there is a loss in strength, but there is a problem. What is the problem? The aluminum alloys cannot be used for elevated temperature applications right, why? It precipitates dissolves now, so the strength is lost. So, there is a limitation in using high strength aluminum alloys at elevated temperatures I am not talking about high temperature, I am talking slightly elevated temperature itself is not going to be ok. So, in order to overcome this, people go for the titanium alloys. It is used in gas turbines, ok, very, very uh, extensively used in gas turbines. In the medium temperature range, actually, around 250 to 400 maximum, people use a titanium alloys, ok. Titanium alloys have high strength uh, at high temperatures, when it's high temperature please look at as medium temperature in the range of 250 to 400 degrees Celsius you can use ok. And, uh, but again it is limited temperatures ok, I can't take it 600, 800 uh, it is not possible ok, you can do that. There is also some problems uh, you, you will you will talk about titanium alloys um, um, ok. What are the problems with the titanium alloys? you cannot use it for storing dry chlorine gas you have seen before right ok. It, it the titanium alloys are very good as long as it is aqueous condition. No? If it is a non aqueous condition the titanium alloys I think are not going to be great actually. And you want to raise the temperature further you go to super alloys they have high strength at uh, reasonably high temperatures you can go up to 800 degrees Celsius and all ok and uh, again moderate 800 you can do, you want to go beyond that what happens? Super alloys are not having strength and also what happens? They also suffer oxidation, hot corrosion. You studied the uh, course on high temperature corrosion right, there you have uh, detailed idea about how the super alloys are vulnerable to various forms of corrosion at high temperatures. In order to overcome this, people give what is called a thermal barrier coatings. The thermal barrier coatings uh, it is a composite coating right. You may also have a, a bond coat and you can also have a ceramic coat. It increases um, oxidation resistance. It also reduces the surface temperature of the super alloy component because thermal barrier means it offers a reduction in the temperature because of the insulation property of that. So, it is used in gas turbine applications ok, but what is the problem there? It is a limited life you know right yes limited life and we need to refurbish it actually right. There are some life for these blades and again you would recoat it or I think you need to do that. And nowadays people are looking at simply ceramic blades, they are now looking at ok ceramic blades and where uh, it is supposed to have good toughness. And of course, ceramic blades may have uh, uh, you know less problem, I mean there may be more problem of um, oxidation and chemical resistance attack you know that could be a problem, but they are things are going on in some direction of that. In fact, G is supposed to come with engines with the ceramics um, replacing some of this uh, super alloys for high temperature applications. You need high temperature in order to make the turbine uh, you know efficiency higher. So, this is about the light metals. Then we can look at the other kind of alloy, the major alloys are used or the copper based alloys ok, they are used in the, in the applications the copper base alloys are used and uh, it is resistance to pitting, resistance to crevice corrosion That is very good actually, but what is the problem with this? The low strength. What increase the strength of this? Alloy with zinc, when alloy with zinc what happens? You get a brass, now brass has high strength. What is the issue there? It undergoes 
desinkubation certain processes. So, how do you overcome that? You add tin, you have antimony, arsenic, phosphorus, ok. These things are added, reduce desinkubation and leads to admiralty brass. The admiralty brass, you know, it resists desinkubation, but you want to increase the uh, zinc more, it does not help, right. And so, it is prone to erosion corrosion, you cannot withstand higher velocity in the pipelines and you want to increase zinc then what happens? You can have erosion corrosion resistance, but it is suffering desinkubation problem. So, what do you do? You go for uh, you know you go for nickel addition to copper and you get cupronickel alloy here. And the cupronickel alloy is resistance to erosion you can go to 3 meters you can even yeah 3 meters per second is the limited limit to which the the, the 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 metal can resist. See again please look at when I say 3 meter per second, you are going to have a very corrosive liquid the 3 meter per second is not I mean valid. We talked about normal water may be sea water ok. So, these are to be seen in a in a you know within with certain within qualification right ok. You know otherwise you cannot blindly just use this um, uh, these, these numbers everywhere actually they are only indicative. And uh, Cooper nickel alloys are prone to ammonia and prone to chlorination. You can't do a very high chlorination, actually, in the systems. And uh, and so you go for titanium alloys. So if you have very high chlorides and ambient temperatures, you go for titanium alloys. But titanium alloys have the problems: the dry chlorine gas you cannot be stable, and uh, its resistance to pitting, crevice corrosion, erosion, corrosion, damage. All this can happen. So I have given broadly three class of. Uh, materials and how it can be used and what are the issues involved here in a in a in a very brief manner ok uh, to get a feel for uh, the, the the materials properties and the selection criteria for them. Any of you have any questions here ok. So, hope things are clear. Now, I am going to uh, go to the next uh, aspect of this. Now, how do I look at material? How do I look at materials development actually ok. Now, I have given you an axis here, it is an x axis time needed for the defects to cause the failures. Now, the time needed to cause the defect to failure has to be higher than the service life of a component ok. If I decide the service has to be 10 years the defect should take maybe 11 years to cause the damage, then the component integrity is fine. Otherwise, what happens? The component will start failing ok. So, the time needed to cause a failure will depend upon the kind of defect that you have. The things that go uh, without saying is the natural environment stresses strain, I, I am not talking about it. I am just comparing that the environmental behavior is similar and what will happen if I change the size of the defect. Now, we look at the the degree of the impact and the defect size if I start relating these two. You get a very nice picture about the corrosion control on one side, materials development on the other side of it actually ok. This is it. Now, what could be the bigger defect? What could be major problem? The problem is the plant itself, the location of the plant itself you know. Suppose, you have you have established a plant just at the seashore or at a, at a, a creek where the sea sea breeze all the time just knocks the plant you have huge amount of chlorides coming to and that can be frequent problems of one component to another component. In fact, I have seen a case in one of the refinery over here, you guys know what is called a cooling tower right, we use cooling tower, cooling tower is used to to run the heat exchangers right, the, the, the chill the water by counter current and that water is now sent to the heat exchangers actually. How does the cooling tower work? water goes from the top you know from the they can somewhat uh, atomize it on the bottom you blow the air 
but the air takes away the heat ok and then water gets cooled down. But when the when the when the air goes from the from the bottom like this ok, it also carries moisture it carries water and when is when assume that that is in the center of the unit center of the plant you can imagine that water way wind goes it is going to carry and all the surrounding areas suffer huge amount of corrosion. So, plant location is a very important thing and wherever it is possible this to be considered. If you have a problem I think you are sure that the time for failure is very short. I given here the time to failure the time to failure is this this much it can happen quickly. If you plug that particular problem assume that that you have overcome the problem and you have a problem in the designs of that it can be catastrophic stress concentration happening stress corrosion cracking can happen within 4 months within 3 months ok. So, I think if there is a faulty design you find then then again you, you see that the time to failure is, is less. If you fix the problem of design you got into problem of fabrication you did not properly fabricate and I think again what happens then the time of a failure is extended, but still is not too far. If you fix the problem of fabrication if you do not look at maintenance inspection all this kind of stuffs in the industry again it is going to be premature failure right. It again it is time is increasing for failure, but then again it fails operation maintenance of that. All these are part of the engineering practice there and the plant practice operating practices ok. It is not related to matter that just the guy who makes the material you may get a better material, but if you do not do things properly I think it is going to make a failures in this case. Assume that all these are taken care of in this case and the life of this can be extended further into that actually. Then what happens then you get into issues related to materials actually. If all I am doing this well, but you do not use the right material then is going to cause the problem. The material can have a defect it could be porosity. You have welded, weld as a porosity, you cast it as a porosity ok and it can big pores inclusions can cause the problem it can fail this here. See the time has improved from here to this, but again it is a premature failure. But if you take care of this large inclusions and all, but you let the small pores small cracks peep in in the material then what happens then again it is going to now fail prematurely that the body have traveled quite this quite a bit quite a far distance in terms of time you have done it actually. But if you can get rid of that, but you can look at fine inclusion this is of course, the manufacturing process have a, we talked about earlier what we talked about the hydrogen blistering where the inclusions are part of it right the inclusions can be there they are fine inclusions actually they are not very coarse inclusion they are fine inclusion they can cause problems in the system, but you can take care of the fine inclusions and if you do not take care of microstructures ok. The microstructure is at a next level of dimension wise right you take do not take care of microstructure I have not done a over aging I have done a peak aging you finished ok it can fail much much earlier it can happen. So, you take care of the microstructures but you have done some cold rolling the dislocations present to the materials can cause stress corrosion cracking. So, if you do not uh, you know and uh, phase distribution again you know this is another thing whether it is it is it is um, whether it is a gray cast iron or white cast iron the phase distribution can be one problem fix that you get into dislocation other dimensions of that again the life is is, is traveling like this here. So, fix the problem of dislocations then we look at elements at the atomic levels atomic level alloying elements ok. Alloying elements point defects all of them are going to be there. This had to be engineered now it is very important it is very important when you talk about a long term implication. I give an example where long term means you never imagined actually. Can you imagine that I need to have a, a, a storage vessel lasting for 10,000 years have you guys have ever imagined about it? you need it to store nuclear waste. The nuclear waste takes long time to you know it is built in this decay right there is radioactive decay it takes about 10,000 years or so in order to subside all this decay and need to contain them in a vessel. 
Now, what happens now? Now, you, you have improved the life and all, but 10,000 years is really a pretty pretty long time and nobody is going to be here to see witness that actually right. But assume that I have taken very nice nickel based alloy or alloy of very high purity. I say sulfur is oh, sulfur is reduced so much reduce 0 0.00 maybe put 3 zeros and 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 let us say about uh, 1 sulfur ok. You are very happy because impurities are controlled atomic level everything is controlled now. But now imagine that the metal corrodes over a time period. Now, when metal corrodes what happens now assume the nickel corrodes, iron corrodes, chromium corrodes everything comes maybe very very low rate no problem. But what happens? the sulfur gets enriched in the surface. And it one atomic layer of sulfur on the surface is sufficient to simply depassivate all of them. It is possible for to calculate how much material is required to be corroded before I enrich the this, this surface with sulfur ok. So, that means it could be a problem. We never anticipated that this sulfur can be a problem because they are looking very good. So, when you talk about life longer life I think what was counted so far is not that you know is not enough you need to count more than that. So, designing alloys at this level is very important in order to have a longer life of this component and these are all we call them as material development ok. The material developments depends on in the, in the life of the component that we expect from here. But again if you engineer materials at that level then what happens the cost also goes up, but then there are situations where cost is not the, the just the criteria safety becomes very important. So, the material development is ongoing process and the corrosion is also an ongoing process. The issue of corrosion was not there today, but you cannot say the issue of corrosion will not be there tomorrow because we talk about environmental issues, we talk about sustainability, we talk about depleting resources and so the corrosion becomes very critical in all these cases. Now, coming to um, cost of corrosion it is uh, it is very important when you look at what the cost of corrosion means. Now, when you talk about material selection also you know it starts from that you know. Now, when you talk about cost of corrosion I mean what is the how much it takes for me to reduce corrosion right or what is the. So, if I am going to look at material is something very expensive material ok or cost more but that only adds to the initial cost of corrosion control right. But you look at what are the cost of corrosion you know that should be added to it right. If you imagine that I am going to have a frequent maintenance, frequent shutdown, then the time for value of money is increases. I can say that I have now working on two, uh, two, two uh, projects with industries. The problem started sometime, it started probably in April or so, I think, ok. And the person calls you and says this is a corrosion problem. Even today, the investigation goes on, ok. It is almost now what from April to now, how many months are over? It is almost about 7 months are over. 7 months are over, we have not got in root cause of the problem at all, actually. There are so many concerns involved, downtime. So, we do not know what is the cost of that, ok. And there is one more case. This is, this is a pharma company, it is a very well known internationally known pharma company. We produce the drugs very, very much actually. There are three reactors all shut down, ok, and now it is going on. Now, it is so when you talk about cost of this, it is not seen only in that perspective of it. What is the downtime that is involved? And some cases you cannot afford the downtime, where it is, for example, defense. Can I can I can I keep the readiness of the this 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 thing? I have to keep them ready, right? I cannot have luxury. Like okay, I am just losing the profit, fine. But here, it is not the question. The question is: Is it really readily ready for use? So some cases you cannot really afford to that actually. Okay. So when you talk about cost of corrosion, I listed a few of them, but again, it is not only that. I want you to think broad. That is why I am just giving this here actually. Okay. There is no way an indication of that I have added everything to the cost of this actually. So, think more than materials, more than fabrication 
and more than you know safety involved. There are several issues involved in defining what the cost of corrosion could be actually. So, it could be a problem. And so, people um, look at the corrosion control in, in many ways and uh, you know and one is called as the asset integrity management ok. Well, you know see you know I have an asset now and I want to see this is functional ok. So, this is a very important subject people nowadays are aware of it actually and they do it in a very periodically and see that the assets are you know are good are functional ok and how do I manage this. And uh, again inspection becomes important part and again inspection sometimes very difficult in aircraft what portion what portion will you see that actually you know. So, that means, you you go for what is called as a risk based inspection. Now, when you talk about risk based inspection then becomes mechanism becomes important then taffel lines becomes important right and thermal lines becomes important ok. If you can able to measure everything physically then they are not important right because I can go and measure it and all right. So, where they are important is then when it comes to prediction when you want to see how I can able to manage things with you know for that I need models I need understanding basic understanding of that ok. So, that is a, a very important thing that happens in the in the um, in the in the in the in the you know in in, in keeping the assets uh, you know um, working actually you know and then do all kind of inspection management and all. Now, again this is a big job here you have inspection you collect the data how to analyze the data actually. I just measure potential right. How do you analyze this? Unless you understand the science of it otherwise you say a potential it has gone from minus 500 to minus 400 oh it is going to go like this I mean what. Sometimes going from minus 400 to minus uh, 500 minus 400 to minus 500 may be good sometimes reverse may be good depends upon what happens there at all actually ok. So, there are a lot more in in in, in managing the corrosion control of um, any equipment ok. And again important is the management how the particular management visualizes the corrosion as issue. Sometime you know you you see that uh, there is a pipeline failure uh, 15 flows died gas got fire you know catch fire and uh, corrosion everybody talks about it and then again the subsides again right till another failure occurs they again work up and then start looking at it ok. But I think things are no more same because there are stricter environmental regulations and controls as it goes I think the corrosion failures are not affordable anymore. So, that becomes very important. So, with this I think I would like to stop uh, the my discussion on this particular course. I do hope you guys had some broad perspective about uh, the, 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 the basics of corrosion and uh, you know and how do you really tackle uh, at the introductory level actually ok. So, thank you very much and I hope that you continue to um, to work on the corrosion control thing and read. So, that you get more and more enriched on this topic. Huh? So, thank you very much.